It's time for Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. Join us as we study the uncompromised Word of God and how it can be applied to our everyday lives. All right, if this is your first time to join us on a Wednesday night, we do things a little bit different on Wednesday night. We have a Bible study, and we have been studying the Holy Spirit, and we have moved into studying the gifts of the Spirit. And I see some faces that weren't here last week, so we'll very quickly go back over some things, and I will try my best not to re-preach last week's service because I'm going to attempt to finish up the rest of the gifts tonight. So if you'll get your pens and paper ready, we'll very briefly go back over the ones that we covered last week. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it is an informational chapter. It is giving us knowledge. He starts off from the very beginning telling us the purpose. He don't want us ignorant. He doesn't want us ignorant on this subject. He, want us, he wants us knowledgeable on this subject. Why? Because the Holy Spirit needs to be able to minister to the world, and it's going to happen through you and me. So if, we're, if the gifts are going to be in operation, it's going to be the church uh, that's doing it, and he wants us to have knowledge and information so that we can have that confidence in being used. Last week, we talked about the three categories uh, and, and, you know, I went through this today when I was going through all these, and I thought, which one is that? Was that gifts of healing or was that working of miracles? Don't get real caught up in the technical side of this. Um, if, if somebody got healed, praise God it's healed. We don't have to stick a label on it. But this is for our learning, so don't get all caught up in the technical. Uh, don't, don't forget the important thing is for you to be praying in the Spirit and praying for people, having that love develop for people so that you are available for these gifts to flow through. We're not going to ask you to identify the gift that you're, if you stand up and give a word, we're not going to stand up and say, was that word of knowledge or word of wisdom? Give the word. <laughs> the rest is just for us to learn from. We talked about the three categories. Uh, there are three gifts that say something, or you might hear them called the utterance gifts. There are three gifts that reveal something, or you might call, hear them called the revelation gifts. And then there's three gifts that do something, and I like to call them the power gifts. And they're pretty exciting to study. All of these, remember, are given at the Spirit's will. We cannot turn these on and off. It's probably a good thing we can't. Uh, this is at God's discretion. This isn't like you receiving your healing by faith, which we teach adamantly around here. Uh, this, these are supernatural manifestations of the Holy Spirit. They are at His will, but what we're learning how to do as a church body is how to be eligible and available. And to be eligible, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, to be available, you need to be praying in the Holy Spirit, and you need to be desiring the love of God to flow into people's lives. And when we get into chapter 13 and chapter 14, you'll see that revealed as well. Last week we talked about the word of wisdom being a part or a fragment of what God knows that he wants revealed to the receiver of the gift, which reminds me, you don't own the gift. <laughs> These are the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and we are either receiving that gift or we're having the privilege of delivering that gift. So, Word of Wisdom is not the gift of wisdom. It's, it's a fragment, it's a piece of what God knows that he needs somebody to know at that time. And we're not going to re-preach. Try not to. Uh, it's supernatural. It's not gained by natural means. It speaks of the future. The Word of Wisdom speaks of the future. It is a revelation gift or a gift that reveals something. We talked about Word of Knowledge which very similarly is a part or fragment of something that God knows that he wants to deal with someone about. It deals with the present or the past. It is a revelation gift as well. We gave examples of these last week. If you missed it, you can download it on the internet. Uh, we talked about the gift of faith. Oh, that inability to doubt. I think we all got pretty excited about that one, and that would be a great one to have. Uh, it's not the faith that you develop, as we talk about so often in Romans 10:17. This is beyond you. 
<laughs> this is a faith that is beyond what you've developed. And you, you have to use your faith in the fact that you believe you can be used by the Holy Spirit to deliver the gift or be used in the gift. But this faith is beyond what you have developed in your life. It is most often seen with uh, the working of miracles, as we'll talk about tonight. And it is a power gift, even though it doesn't necessarily do the doing, uh, it is involved in it. And we'll talk about that when we get to working of miracles. I really want to stress tonight, you'll hear me saying this repeatedly, so I know it must have been the Lord, uh, the Holy Spirit wanting to repeat this tonight. We need to desire the gifts. And I think that's what this knowledge does. We don't need to be afraid of the gifts. You can't, you can't desire something you're afraid of. So we're getting information, and I know that information is not always fun and exciting, but we're here to learn. And it is exciting because I know where the Holy Spirit's going when he's teaching us. He's getting us ready to be used. And uh, I looked through tonight. I was we were looking at prophecy and tongues and interpretation of tongues. And so I dug out of my drawer because Debbie always makes, or Tanya always makes me a copy when a prophecy or tongues and interpretation is done here at the church. This is since January. That makes me very, very happy. That means, and these, I think one of them was given by me. That's good, Vic. That's what you want to see in a church. That's beautiful to me. If you ever want a copy of a word that's given, you can ho holler at the office and we'll be glad to get that for you. I reread the one that came a couple of weeks ago on a Wednesday night. And man, it just excited me all over again. It was good for me to read those. So desire the gifts. Desire the gifts to flow through you. Be eligible, be knowledgeable, and be available. All right, we got down to verse 9. Last week, we talked about uh, faith. So to another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healings by the same Spirit. You'll notice he keeps repeating, by the same Spirit, by the same Spirit. Because these manifestations are not manifestations of different spirits of God. They are a manifestation of God, the Holy Spirit. They are by the same Spirit, but he manifests himself according to the needs of the people here. Gifts of healings. You'll notice I say healings. It is plural in verse 28. And in most of the time when you're reading this and, and studying um, Kenneth Hagin's teaching on this and Marilyn Hickey's teaching on this, everybody I've read agrees gifts of healings. I don't think it's a big deal either way, but it does make more sense due to the diseases and sicknesses that are in the earth. This gifts of healings is a supernatural healing of sickness and disease not gained by natural means. And you know, a lot of people out in the world think that doctors and medicine are part of gifts of healings. No, this is the Holy Spirit. This is a supernatural taking away of disease and sickness by the Holy Spirit. This is not what you have uh, believed for, built your faith for. Uh, we do believe in receiving healing by faith. But this is a supernatural gift from the Holy Spirit that takes sickness and disease from a person. And there is, I don't know... I say this about every one of them, I think. I don't know if there's anything more exciting than this. For someone to receive a gift of healings. And it is certainly thrilling when you get to be used in this gift. It's a special gift. It's, it's either delivered to you or through you. And you'll often see word of knowledge used with this. You see that a lot here at RCC. Uh, you'll, you'll, somebody will say, there's somebody here, you're having pain on your left side, or you've, you know, you've got a lump, or you know, you're having trouble with a tendon in your right knee. That's a word of knowledge, but that word of knowledge is preceding what is fixing to happen, and that is gifts of healing, because if the Holy Spirit calls that out, and you come up, you're there to receive the gift. Or if you're delivering, you're there to deliver a gift. That is what's coming next, and you'll see them work beautifully together, as we've talked about on some of these other ones, how these gifts can flow together because they're of the same spirit. Gifts of healing is a power gift. 
because it is a gift that does something. You can turn to Acts 14. And we'll start reading in verse 8. Are you close? All right. I'm reading out of the NIV. In Lystra there sat a man crippled in his feet, who was lame from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking, and Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, Stand up on your feet. At that the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted, and they said, The gods have come down to us in human form. I'll, I just put that part in there because I like that part. <laughs> the gods have come down to us in human form. Indeed, God has come down to the earth in the form of the Holy Spirit who lives and dwells on the inside of each and every one of you sitting here today. And therefore, you can do these miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit can flow through you as he wills. And that's what happened here. And you probably noticed something else because we're studying the gifts. When he saw this man, it says he perceived, I believe the King James Version says, he saw he had faith to be healed. That was supernatural. He didn't know that because the guy told him he had faith to be healed. That was one of the gifts being involved. So you start labeling these in your head as you're reading this and start recognizing them as you're reading your scripture. But the guy wasn't healed. And just because gifts of healing is delivered, is, is given by the Holy Spirit, doesn't mean the person doesn't have faith to be healed. Sometimes people don't activate the faith they've had. Sometimes they just get busy with life and they, they put up with that knee pain. And the Holy Spirit says, somebody here has having pain in their right knee. And he calls it out. Then gifts of healing. Doesn't mean they don't have faith. This guy had faith, but he wasn't healed. But Paul saw it. Through the Holy Spirit, he saw that he had faith. He called out, and the man was healed healed bones ligaments muscles not through physical therapy you know Karen we've talked often about when you were healed it was progressive right you wiggled your big toe because you could wiggle your big toe and then you progressively this guy this guy had never walked all the muscles were there, the ligaments were there, the bones were there. It didn't have to be a creative miracle. God didn't have to give him legs. But it was not normal for a man who's never walked to jump up and start walking. If you've ever been through physical therapy, you know that. But instantly, his body was healed and was strengthened. That was a supernatural gift. No aid came through the natural. Many times, gifts of healing will be instant. I have on occasion, especially with dad, well, actually different ministers, I've heard ministers deliver a gift of healing and say, by the time, in, in three hours, you know, where uh, the gift started. But most of the time, it's going to be instant when it's gifts of healing. But I have heard several times where ministers would say, by the time you wake up in the morning, this will be complete, or give instructions along those lines. We need to desire this gift in the body of Christ for the world. For the body of Christ and for the world. People are sick. They are without hope with doctors. They're on so many medications that they, they about have to have a schedule to tell them when to take what and when to do what. It affects all the other parts of their body. We should be zealous for this gift. If anything ought to make you get up in the morning and pray in tongues and pray in the Spirit or spend time before service instead of just rushing in here and showing up, it's this. We need to be desirous of this gift. All right, let's go to working of miracles. We are no, by no means exhausting these. Working of miracles. Hmm. 
It's another good one. It's a supernatural intervention by God in the ordinary course of nature. Supernatural in intervention by God in the normal course of nature. This is a power gift, and it does do something. And it is exciting when you get to see it happen. I'm thankful for the years that we grew up when the faith message was really coming on strong. Brother Hagen, Brother Copeland, Brother Savell, all these guys, were, you know, it was, it was new. It was new to us. I mean, I know Kenyon had been there and Wigglesworth had been there, but, you know, we didn't have the Internet. So our parents would drag us, you know. I, I won't say they dragged me because I think I was always probably the first one in the car. Because going and watching T.L. Osborne, and hear him talk about the, the miraculous things that would happen to him as a missionary and the gifts he would get to deliver to the people. And then to watch at those big conventions, gifts of healings and working of miracles as a child, to get to experience that. I'm, I miss those days sometimes. You know, it's different when you're watching it on television or you're watching it on your computer. But when you get to witness working of miracles, people that don't have eyeballs, having eyeballs formed in their sockets, whew, it's a power gift. You can just about open the Bible and point your finger and hit a miracle. I mean, especially in the Old Testament. Uh, there was lots of working of miracles. Basically, you know, they were, spirit they were spiritually dead. So working of miracles had to be very prevalent. Uh, they didn't have what you have. I was thinking about the parting of the Red Sea. I know Dad always used this example a lot, and I think it's a great one. It is not natural for water to stand up. It, it, it's not natural for water to part and to stand up, and it's not natural for where the water had been for years and years and years to be dry. It's just, that's not natural. That is a miracle. That is outside, normal, and what would naturally happen. So it takes a miracle for water to stand up and for millions of people to be able to walk through on dry ground. And this is a perfect example of gift of faith, which we talked about last week, working with um, miracles. Because not only did it take a miracle for that water to stand up, but it took a miracle for millions of people to calmly walk through water standing up. And if you've ever left a concert or a big sporting event, you know calm and hurry don't work too well together. And if you think about a, a nation of people, not 13 like Dad talked about on the flannel graph board as he was growing up. There wasn't 13 children of Israel. This was a nation that calmly passed through a sea, gift of faith. Gift of faith had to be in operation. That's a good example of the two of those working together. The, the gift of faith, and this is why Brother Hagin says that the gift of faith receives the miracle. It's in operation through the miracle, so to speak. Then the working of miracles does the miracle. Lines don't let you sleep. You, you don't go to bed in a room full of lions and live without the working of miracles. You, you don't walk around inside a fiery furnace without the working of miracles. Water does not turn to wine. Lake Dardanelle would be a big bottle. It's been out there a while, as long as I can remember. It has never turned to wine. That naturally doesn't happen. Those are workings of miracle. They're outside the ordinary course of nature. And the dead don't come back to life unless there's a miracle. So I put Acts chapter 9 in my notes. I like raising the dead. I've wished for it on more than one occasion. And I think it's something that we should desire for working of miracles when a miracle is needed for us to be eligible and available if the Holy Spirit so chooses to use this gift. 
Acts chapter 9, verse 39. It says, Then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber where the young girl had died. And all the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth. I like that. He knelt down and prayed. And turning him to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. She opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. We should desire. We should be zealous. One version says we should covet the gifts. We should desire them. Now you'll hear, you'll hear uh, Brother Hagen quote Howard Carter a lot. And I do not have any of his books, but it might be something if you're interested in this subject. Because if Brother Hagen learned from him, uh, I, I think I probably need to order a few. Howard Carter said this, This working of miracles is indeed a might gift, glorifying the God of all power, stimulating the faith of his people, and astonishing and confounding the unbelief of the wicked. Working of miracles is undeniable. You might can argue away prophecy. You might can argue away gifts of healings. But gifts of miracles, there is no arguing it away. It is beyond explanation. And we need to desire it. All right. Let's go to a prophecy. He says, this is still verse 10, to another prophecy. You'll see this one around here a lot as well. Prophecy is the supernatural utterance in a known tongue or in a known language. It's a supernatural utterance in a known language. You're supernaturally speaking for God in that moment. Man, what a moment. And a lot of times you can tell, even when, even when someone's teaching or preaching, and they're just going along, they may not say, thus saith the Lord, but you'll hear a tone change. Sometimes you can even see, I know we used to do this with Dad. We could tell when, this, when the anointing would come on Dad and he was fixing to change from speaking for himself to speaking God. You would see a skin tone change. You remember? It is, it's like the anointing would hit. and It's like cold water hit him or something and his, his skin would change. I'm not saying he morphed into God or anything. I'm just saying, <laughs> you know. It, but there would be a, a, an authoritative tone that would that would come into the voice. And, and you, you see this pretty regularly around here. You, you'll hear a tone change. And that authority change comes because you're no longer speaking of your own authority. You're speaking for God in that moment. Whether you're speaking to somebody at Walmart and a gift of prophecy is given. And you know, a lot of times people think that prophecy, or they hear the word prophetic, they always think it's doom and gloom about the future. That's false. And we'll, we'll learn more about that when we get into chapter 14. But that's, that's false. Uh, chapter 14 tells us that prophecy edifies, exhorts, and comforts recipient. And just because you give a word of prophecy through this gift doesn't make you a prophet. You may prophesy and not be called in the five-fold ministry office of a prophet because their role was a little different. So don't get those two confused. They are separate. This is not yours. This is the Holy Spirit allowing you for that specific moment to speak for God. And it is powerful. And it is important. It is an utterance gift because it says something. Vine says it's the speaking forth of the mind and counsel of God. 
the speaking forth of the mind and counsel of God. It can be concerning the past, present, or future. It doesn't matter. It's a, I like Hagen's word, it's a forth telling of the will of God. Not a foretelling, but a forth, forth telling of the will of God. We'll talk about it more when we get into, we'll talk about all of them more when we get into chapter 14, actually. You can look at Acts 21, verse 8. A lot of these scriptures will be in Acts. It says, In the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, which were virgins, which did prophesy. So this is not a gift that is uh, limited to men, as we've, we've studied a couple of, couple of weeks here about women in the ministry. This is something that's available, and you just have to love the prophet Joel in chapter 2, where he said, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids, in those days will I pour out my spirit. Don't even be surprised if your children speak forth, forth words of prophecy, because it has been prophesied that they can. And it is a gift, a supernatural gift of the Holy Spirit. A lot of people want to say prophecy is preaching. I can see where they get that, but this is a gift given at will by the Holy Spirit. It's a supernatural manifestation of the Holy Spirit, and you will sense the difference when it happens. It's to supernaturally speak for God, and we sure need to desire to be able to do that when God has something he needs said with his authority behind it, he will use this gift by the Holy Spirit. Continuation of verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 12 goes to the next gift, which is discerning of spirits. Now this one, fruity people get even fruitier. Okay? This is not the gift of discernment. You'll hear people say, I have the gift of discernment. That's called the gift of suspicion, and it's not from God, okay? The Holy Spirit is never a gossiper. If he reveals something to someone to be used in one of these gifts, it will be for that person's benefit. Because as we talked about, chapter 14 starts off with the basis for all of this is that you're following after love. You desire the gifts because you are pursuing love. So this is not the gift of discernment. There's a big difference. This is the gift of discerning of spirits. This is a supernatural insight into the spirit world. The spirit world is real. It's around us right now. And we just forget sometimes. But sometimes God needs to show us what's going on beyond what we can see. And discerning the gift of discerning of spirits will allow us to do that. Howard Carter said this, By the discerning of spirits, we see beyond the sphere of which we have been created. It is only by the revelation of the Holy Spirit that we can perceive the beings that live in the spirit world. I haven't had this happen, but I'm waiting. Discerning of spirits. There's a whole other world out there, and it's real. And the Holy Spirit can open your eyes to see it. And I've, I've heard all kinds of Brother Hagen stories. Uh, I, I love that he taught so much on the gifts because the, the world was ignorant, and therefore they, they moved in a lot of error in the church and the gifts because they weren't taught. They didn't know how to handle what what was happening or they wanted to match what was happening in other people and they performed rather than being used in the gifts. But he would often talk about even when he was laying hands on people for healing that sometimes he would see 
through the gift of discerning of spirits and he would see spirits of infirmity or different things that were going on with the people and he was allowed to see in the spirit world, then that would change how he would uh, pray when he was praying for that person. So this is a gift that's needed. It's, it's not spooky. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. So it's going to be for good. And so it's not something that we should be afraid of, but it is something that we should be open to because we trust the Holy Spirit. It, it could be angels that you're seeing. It could be the similitude of Christ that you're seeing. It could be, I mean, it could be evil spirits that you're seeing. It could be spirits of infirmities that you're seeing. Sometimes there's spirits over cities. Well, there's spirits over cities. Sometimes you're allowed to see them. <laughs> Maybe that would be a better way of saying it. But a lot of times, even in intercessory prayer, this will open up for the Holy Spirit to need to use this gift with you so that you can see what's going on in the spirit world. A lot of intercessors will have this gift manifested in their lives. So it's a good one, and it's important. Second, current, uh, Second Kings, I love this example. You've got to love anything that talks about Elisha, right? Second Kings chapter 6 gives us a great example. You remember... Elisha and his servant are surrounded by the enemy. And in verse 15, it says, And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Boss, what are we going to do? I mean, they are surrounded and they are, their enemy is well equipped. And he, and he answered and he said, don't fear. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha opened his eyes beyond his physical eyes to where he could see into the spirit world and then he saw the, the host of the armies of God that had the enemy outnumbered we need to desire this gift we need to be knowledgeable about this gift where we're not scared of it anymore if he shows us something there should be no fear with that there should be authority with that and there should be peace with that that's an exciting one. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. Again, to another diverse kinds of tongues. Now, this one can get a little confusing for people because we, you know, we're a spirit-filled church. Uh, almost everybody that comes here is spirit-filled, speaks in tongues. So here we have this. Because remember, all these gifts are supernatural gifts that are working at the Holy Spirit's will. Well, I can speak in tongues anytime I want to. So this has to be something different. And a lot of people get confused by this. So notice the word diverse is added. Remember, italicized words are added. But I believe it's just in, in adding it because verse 28 also uses that word. So don't let that, don't let that bother you that it's an added word. The gift of diverse kinds of tongues is a supernatural utterance by the Holy Spirit in languages never learned by the speaker. It'll be different than you speaking. And once again, like we talked about with prophecy, a lot of times you'll hear somebody in our congregation that you can hear talking in tongues often, you know, when, during praise and worship or even, even when they're hearing the word and they, you'll hear them over there praying in tongues. But when somebody is being used in this gift, there again, there will be this authority and this tone change. Why? Because they are speaking something for God. And you'll notice a difference. Sometimes that, that same person that you hear speaking in tongues, often during praise and worship or during uh, quiet times, but when it changes, you, all I can tell you is you just know the difference. It, it is a supernatural gift manifest by the Holy Spirit. This is different than your prayer language. Um, this doesn't happen at your will. This is at the Holy Spirit's will. You might call it special kinds of tongue. Um, 
It's a special. It's something special. It's not something that we do every day. Not that our every day is not special, but this is different. It, of course, works with the interpretation of tongues. In fact, when we get into chapter 14, we'll be directed that we're not to give uh, diverse kinds of tongues unless there's someone there that is used also in interpretation of tongues or if you can interpret the tongue yourself. Once again, we're learning. And I don't want you to be afraid to step out. So if you feel like you have a message to give uh, in tongues, with diverse kinds of tongues, and nobody interprets, we're going to keep going. We're learning. I don't ever want what we're teaching to hold you back. I want you to grow in it. We want to grow in it. And if, if you have question about this and you think sometimes that, um, was that what that was? You know who's used in the congregation. Talk to them. Come talk to me. Come talk to Dad. Come talk to Mom. Come t uh, Cindy is used a lot in, in tongues. Um, ask questions. It's okay to ask questions. That's how we learn. And I know, uh, to me, it seems like if you're going to be used in, the, in this gift, it's like it doesn't satisfy until you say it out loud. Like if you're just sitting on your pew and you're thinking, oh, I feel like praying in tongues. And you start praying in tongues, but it, it, that doesn't satisfy it. There's like a, an authority that needs to come out behind it. Am I saying that right, Mom? It's not that you can't hold it back. Because the Holy Spirit's a gentleman, remember? He's not going to make you. It keeps coming back. It's not satisfied. Even if you just say it to yourself on the pew, it's not satisfied. You feel like it's something you're supposed to give. You will know. You will know. And if you, if you speak a word and it's not interpreted, we're going to keep going. So I don't want that to hold you back. It works with interpretation of tongues. If someone's here that can interpret, or you should pray that you should interpret. We'll learn about that in chapter 14 as well. This, of course, is an utterance gift. Did I tell y'all, did we mention that uh, discerning of spirits is a revelation gift because it reveals something? I don't know if we said that or not. Discerning of spirits is a revelation gift because it reveals something, okay? This diverse kinds of tongues is uh, an utterance gift because it says something. And I, I, I was going through my old Bible school notes. Thank God for those old Bible school notes. And I love this that I found that Dad had written in his notes. It said, in the gift of tongues, I should say the gift of diverse kinds of tongues, you become the Holy Spirit's helper. In your daily prayer language of tongues, the Holy Spirit is your helper. So that's a great way to tell the difference here. When you're praying in tongues in your your daily life, then the Holy Spirit is your helper. But when you're used in this gift, you became the Holy Spirit's helper. That's an honor. And we shouldn't be afraid to walk in it. These last two gifts that we just talked about, or that we're talking about, diverse kinds of tongues and interpretation of tongues are not seen in the Old Testament. I'd never thought about that before. I had Brother Hagin playing while I was getting ready tonight, and he said that, and I thought, all the other gifts can be found in the Old Testament, but not this one. This one's for you. This one is for you, New Testament church, because you are filled with the Holy Spirit. And uh, it's an interesting thought. It is, it is for this dispensation, I believe, is the way Brother Hagin said it, and I like that. Let's talk about interpretation of tongues before we run out of time. This is the supernatural interpretation of the utterance in other tongues. So when someone is used in the gift of diverse kinds of tongues and they give a message in tongues, then the thoughts will start coming to you of what was said. But it'll be with an authority behind it. And actually, if, if you're, not, I've, I've never been used in this gift yet. I'm looking forward to it. I'm open to it. But it, it seems to me like 
when I hear someone give the gift in diverse kinds of tongues, I'm not thinking, I bet they're saying. And that never even comes to me. You know what I'm doing? I'm waiting to hear somebody stand up and say what that means. I, I'm not sitting there thinking what the Lord's saying. Do y'all, I mean, y'all don't sit there and think what the Lord's saying. So if those thoughts start coming to you of what that means, it would be like if, if I stood up here and spoke in Spanish, which would be a miracle. I, I don't get much beyond nacho and burrito. So if I stood up here and spoke in Spanish and my mother knew what I was saying, that would be the gift because she has no comprehension of it, nor do I. So if, if somebody's speaking in tongues and you're, you're hearing what they're saying in English, give the interpretation. You just got used. And it's powerful. And it's important. And you say, well, why does... Because it, when we get over into chapter 14, it'll indicate that the, the gift of diverse kinds of tongues with interpretation of tongues kind of equals prophecy. What's the difference? Why does God use tongues and interpretation of tongues instead of somebody just prophesying? Read, verse, read chapter 14, you'll find out. It's for the unbeliever. That's the answer. It's for the non-believer. And he makes that very plain, and y'all will enjoy chapter 14. It's amazing. We'll have a good time in that. We'll get a lot more practicalities of this and learn a lot more when we get to it. So supernatural utterance in an unknown tongue becomes supernatural utterance in a known tongue when these two are going together. It will be interpreted. And, and I know one thing that, that we always like to cover is this is interpretation of tongues, not translation of tongues. And Brother Hagen really dwells on this too. And that's important because if you're translating something, you're translating it word for word. If I have a translator up here and they're translating into Spanish, they're going to translate exactly what I'm saying. This is interpretation. You know what? God loves personality. He really does. He likes to use people. And so you'll, you'll hear somebody get up and give a message in tongues, and if it's my mom, it's going to be long, if it's my dad, it's going to be short. And then you'll hear somebody stand up and give it, and you think, well, that was, Tom gave a short word in tongues, but Bonnie stood up and interpreted it, and it took her five minutes to say. That's because it, it's not translation, it's interpretation. And so personality will come into play because God can only use the words that you have. So don't, don't be confused if somebody stands up and gives a short or long word in tongues and then the, the interpretation is not the exact same length. That's because it's not, it's not translated word for word. It is interpretation. And if you get up here and interpret what I teach rather than translate what I teach, it's going to be different. And that's important to know because I know a lot of people question it and that's... That's the reasoning behind it. He makes that plain. I want to end with 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1. And I want this to be your meditation this week. Before we start in chapter 14, next Wednesday. Because of everything that we've talked about, we just seed it into you. You can do more study on but this, this is what I want the message to be tonight. Desire it. Start desiring it. Not just to happen around you. But start desiring for the gifts to flow through you if the Holy Spirit so chooses to use you. Why would you use somebody that doesn't want to be used? Why would you use somebody... I mean, I don't even want somebody working for me that doesn't like what they do. Well, why would the Holy Spirit 
So he says here, I'm reading out of the Amplified because it uses more words, eagerly pursue. I like those words. Eagerly pursue and seek to acquire this love. Make it your aim. Make it your great quest and earnestly desire and cultivate. What a great word. Earnestly desire and cultivate the spiritual endowments or the spiritual gifts. Cultivate. 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 What does that mean? What does that word cultivate mean to you? Nurture it. Yeah, keep it ready. Cultivate. I, when I think of cultivate, I think of farm. I think of cultivating the land, plowing up the ground, having it ready for that seed to be planted. He has asked us to pursue and follow after love and to desire spiritual gifts. We don't follow gifts, we follow love and we desire gifts. So if y'all will make that first verse of chapter 14 your meditation this week, I think that things will really start stirring on the inside of you. All right, revelation gifts were things that reveal word of knowledge, word of wisdom, discerning of spirits. You got it. Power gifts were gifts of healing, working of miracles, gift of faith. Utterance gifts, gifts that say something, prophecy, diverse kinds of tongues, and interpretation of tongues. We've marathoned this, but I'm excited about it. I want to, since we've got a few minutes, which is very unusual for me, as you know. I want to reread the word of prophecy because I think it's such a great example. This would be word of prophecy, gift of prophecy that came November the 8th on a Wednesday night as we were talking about the Holy Spirit. Like I said, when you talk about him, he likes it. My people, I would say unto you that I am the mighty of the mightiest. I am the strongest of the strong. I am the glory of God. I am Shekinah glory. I am his presence. I am his right hand. I am his right arm. My desire as I live in you is to flow through you. Not only to provide you with might and power to live your life, but to flow through you to others that oppression might flee and destruction might flee. I want my people to be at peace and joy and through my presence, through my glory, that peace and joy will come not only to you, but others around you. I desire to flow through. Forget the traditions of man. Don't look to things that you've seen in the past, but think of me in terms of the loving Father who desires to be in you and to flow through you and receive. Don't look back on things that might cause you to be condemned or the judgment of man, but rejoice in me, rejoice in me, rejoice in me, and I will come to you. Draw nigh to me, and I will draw nigh to you. This is not a hard thing, for I desire it more than you desire it. Let me flow through you. Let me flow through you freely. That's, that is the Holy Spirit talking. So we're not going to be ignorant. We're not going to just be desirous and do it ignorantly. We're going to have knowledge and desire pushed by love and great things the Holy Spirit can do through you. Amen? Y'all can stand. This has been Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. If you would like more teaching, you can visit our website at www.rccenter.org or download our app to your device. The Russellville Christian Center is located at 305 Lakefront Drive. 
If you would like to purchase a copy of this program or if you would like more information, please call 479-968-7965.